Welcome everyone back to Cat's Eye on the Future. Tonight we have a very special show. We're just basically sitting around a kitchen table here in California where I'm visiting and we're having a conversation with Ralph and Marsha Ring about lots of different topics. Ralph is primarily known and has done many hundreds of interviews on his work on flying cars and zero point energy and various forms of technology most in the 1950s and 60s and we may talk about some of that because as ralph has been explaining to me everything is all connected anyway but we were we were just sitting around talking and i thought i'd turn the computer on and to, because this is just so interesting we wanted to share it with everyone and right now we're kind of on the topic of the knights templars and ralph was explaining to me some of the history of both the ancient organization and the modern one well the uh... In, in ancient times, there were, well, as they are today, there are victims and there are, are, are protectors of the people. And uh, the Templars go back, actually, before Jerusalem. That's where they got their notoriety as protecting people to go worship as they, they chose and find their destiny, their own path as they want. And the Templars were just making sure on the way they didn't get robbed or killed or so forth. And uh, they or they had allegiance to the highest power that, that they called the Christ and uh, that they honored the Christ consciousness, if you will, of what the Christ represents, which is all of us collectively. We're all one part of the same source, if you will. And so they, but they chose to, to protect people, to honor and their rights, in their pursuit of uh, life, liberty, and and, uh, and freedom, and uh, and that carried on for quite some time. They had some problems at at King Solomon's uh, temple in, in Jerusalem at one time, and the, the alleged um, story of of the Ark of the Covenant was down below the Ark of the Rock, stone rock of the stone of the rock, or something. And it's in the same Dome. Oh, you mean the dome of the rock, the um, the, the, the mosque, yeah. Underneath, and uh, and and then all of a sudden, it disappeared, and they they don't really know where it went or, or how it went. But but the Templars felt that the times being what they were, they would get worse before they got better, and rather than just, um, and I'm, I'm talking from my own opinion. I'm using metaphors that I have no idea what the. What the grassroots area. But they felt they would take some of these treasures they had, bind together into what's called now the mystery schools, to keep the uh, the understanding and the conception of the source or Christ in an area where they understood each other, they were of like mind. They were, it, uh, it was a multidimensional state of consciousness in those days they they honored the um, all the spirits and all the gods of uh, all the cultures everywhere but they um, had to keep them kind of separate because people would not understand and their ignorance would want to uh, for instance the, the, the gold and things that were uh, uh, a part of their treasure for the most part would have been taken and disappeared for nothing had they not hung on to them with the idea that the time will come when this all has to be given back to the people when they have reached a state of mind where they are consciously aware of being what they are they are much more than this human form called uh, uh, you know a vessel or a body they're much much more than that but they've lost the uh, they've lost touch with with that knowledge and until they get back, which we're doing now, so there is a, a big transition in progress, getting back to remembering who and what we are in our past uh, experiences and cultures that have gone on. But along the way, the um, I think it was King Philip that, that, that persecuted the, uh, the knights, and they had them, allegedly, they had a lot of them killed and everything because of, of their monetary values and things well, we i don't think know. i think they, that he thought that they were all 
well, they were all removed, and there were a few nights that actually hid and went underground. My my understanding as someone who um, is in a historical reenactment group that goes from about the fall of Rome to the 1600s is that um, there was the, the king had, as always happened in Europe, had borrowed an awful lot of money from the Templars since they had kind of the proto-banking yeah. organization, and he didn't want to pay his loans back. And this was also, a, he took a the same way that a number of English kings would throw out the Jews periodically because they would borrow money from the Jewish community, uh, they, they they would then throw out, you know, get rid of people so they wouldn't have to pay off their loans with the Templars, Philip the, the Fair or Philip the Unfair, as one of my history books called him, actually just, you know, one night just decided that that would be the way to get a lot of money fast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they arrested Jacques de Molay and, and the others. And, um, and I believe that's where Friday the 13th comes from, doesn't it? Because it's all happened on Friday the 13th, and making it an unlucky day. But I know that it's believed that there were Templars that escaped, especially Scotland. Oh, yeah. And, and that would be Rosalind Chapel and all of that. And they'd oh, been they like, like rogue knights. But some of them wanted to bring the Templars, the, the um, essence of, of knighthood back, and they started creating an organization, the Knights Templar. And uh, Queen Elizabeth was um, a facilitator in getting this under her control in Europe. And um, they started an organization. Well, any organization that has to, to survive eventually runs into the uh, to economics. Of, they have to have some way of taking care of themselves. Well, unfortunately, economics can be very, very detrimental when it comes to the freedom of of being who and what you are and the creative powers that you have to get things without without worrying about money. So there was kind of a breach. There was kind of a, uh, where they said, well, we've got to have money and then, and then now we've got to protect ourselves. So now we have to have guns. Uh, we, we had swords, of course, but now we have to have guns. And so it built up, uh, we priory that uh, Marsh and I belonged to uh, it was a fortress. It was a castle with, with gun ports and, and underground facilities that had uh, armament that was enough to a small army, and they had firing ranges and everything. And uh, it was our job, as we found out later from other knights that came from Sweden and, and Norway, to bring light back into the knights because they had lost their their premise, they lost their way, they were living then in a state of fear instead of love. True knighthood is just the love of the Christ, the love of themselves, and love of humanity. It's all one. But they, the ones that had gotten into organization had lost that. And because of the fear, started armoring themselves and, and building little fortresses here and there. And um, there's quite a large... Uh, a community of Knight Templars in the United States, and they actually came over or opened up in the United States from from England, from mm -hmm. Europe, about 25 years ago, and that was the, the group that we were knighted with. And uh, they, it's it's a large organization here in the states. My question also was: you mentioned Queen Elizabeth. Did you mean the first or the second? First. first. So, yeah. would John D. have been involved in this in any way? The here famous advisor who was also an occultist, an astrologer. Mm, no, that would be an interesting thing to look up because right. um, John Dee is just a sort of he's a hazily he's he, the rumor is that that England was saved from the Spanish Armada because John Dee gathered the magicians of England and and did a ceremony that caused that brought the great wind. And then there was this, this again, the, the legend is, and I've talked to older people who say that the second part at least is true, at least as far as I understand it, that during World War II, during the absolute worst of the bombings of England, that there was a meeting of a grand coven, which was to contact every single witches, occultists, astrologers, anyone, anyone with any training whatsoever, and they all, even if they couldn't all gather together at the same time, they, uh, each person and each group did their did a ritual to repel the the German invasion, and that was what saved. The belief is that that is what saved England. That's when the tide of the war began to turn, and it was. But it was based on this older legend that John Dee had done the same thing. So I just wondered if it would be because he was such his hands were into so many different things. He was also one of a, not 
the best remembered of Elizabeth's spy masters, but he was probably involved in that. And he eventually fell from grace, like a lot of people do. And you yes. know, it, that's another reason I think why he's not as well remembered because he he did not stay right her favorite person. Situation as it, as it often does when 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 money comes into play, when money becomes more important than the welfare of the of the people, then you have corruption, a great deal of corruption going on, and uh, of bribing and and uh, uh, well, stealing sometimes comes into play, stealing the rights of others on paper or sometimes in the physical forms of taking over situations. Well, anyway, we were we were put into the Knights to effect a change, to get them back to love as, yes. as a guide instead of fear. And we were instructed by some very high Knights that came from Sweden and, and, and uh, Norway. We came over, we had a round table meeting, a huge round table in Phoenix, where the prior and all his constituents were there. And uh, they were here to talk came over to talk with the prior, the head of the order. They refused to talk to the prior and came over and wanted to talk to Marsh and I. And, and they, they, they pointed out they knew who we were. This is on a, on a subliminal, subconscious level, because when you get into a state of consciousness that transcends the ordinary thought patterns, you get into a feeling of, uh, uh, well, into feelings instead of thought, and you, you just know. You, you know the demeanor or the uh, character of a person without having to know the background of the details of their life, how they got there and everything. is really irrelevant when you get to the point you can see, you can sense the soul. And true knights operate from the soul. They don't operate from, from the brain. And, uh, for instance, I've gone to meetings with, with, with fellow knights. I had no way of knowing, and cell phones didn't work. They just say be there at a certain time in certain places across the country. And I just knew I'd get on a train and go. I had no idea where I was going. And I'd wind up and this is the stop. And I got off and, and no, no cell phones would work. Who's going to pick me up or what? But fear, if it enters the picture, then it, it negates everything. Everything cancels out. So I had to have faith that, well, this might be a, this might be a, uh, a wild goose chase, but I never thought that. I just knew that it was, it was going to come together. So, so then pretty soon a night showed up, and then we had to get in a vehicle and then drive a hundred miles and into the forest. And uh, we were supposed to be at, at dinner, the rendezvous at six, 6 p.m. on a certain place at a certain remote uh, resort, and then uh, we were going around following our feeling. No, oh, this go this down this way. No. Let's go this way. We had to follow our feelings to get there. And we round we wound up there at ten o'clock, just as they came out to greet us, saying dinner's just starting. They knew they knew exactly the time difference of, between what they said and what so in so the reason I brought that up is that true true knighthood has little to do with the third dimensional consciousness. It, it really we it, they're as human as anybody else, but they're also, uh, from their soul, an energy being. An immortal being is inhabiting the water vessel in which they inhabit. And uh, we realize, and this is the mystery school, going back to information that had to be withheld for a while, almost now coming out all over, on all levels, that we are creating the physical third dimension. It, it really, in a sense only exists because we create it. That means that uh, we're dealing with, with pure reality of truth, like uh, there really is no past, there really is no future, there's only the moment, there's only the now, and that we build a whole empire on the idea, well, yesterday I did this and I'll do it again tomorrow, and we run into trouble by the conflicting ideas that will never work coming from from the intellect or from the academia so you have to come from feelings and you have to know that this is going to feel good at this moment and that moment and so forth the sacred geometry or the you know based on the, the golden mean and all those things come into play but i guess the reason i brought that up was after these knights left 
Marsha and I went to the went to the went to the fortress. It was a huge place, and uh, and Marsha had business with the prior's uh, wife, which was a, she was also high up on the. On she the then she t then took over the fire. She yeah, she took fire. it over. Yeah, but uh, so I sat down with with John. He was the the, the prior. The prior, and I said, John, this has got to go back to love. You you guys are, you know you. I, I'm a metaphor now because I yeah. don't know, and I had to do it in a way that fit the. Yeah. I had to plug in. So I said, "You got to go back to love because this is not going to get you anywhere. Fear is going to always be getting fear, and then you'll go on and on forever and, and never get anywhere." And I did it in such a way that he got it, and he had to ponder it for a while, and we discussed it for two or three hours. And he was really reluctant to let go of the idea that knights have to be strong and honored and protective and everything. I said, oh, it's, the idea has gotten away from the true Christhood that the knights represent. And he says, well, I'll tell you, Ralph, I get it, but what if? And the minute he said, what if, I knew that he was going to stand his, his ground and, and I was going to beg his pardon and leave because it wasn't going the way. And I, then I quickly, and Marcia had risen to the, to the state of the uh, uh, chaplain in the priors, and we had many, many gatherings and rituals and, and everything where we were knighting new knights into the into the thing. And but when this happened, the signal was okay. That's we have to become back into the rogue or the silent knights the, the situation where a knight is just within their soul. They know they're following the oneness of creation, and that we're all created and. We want to help each other on a level that's going to be wholesome and good and, and, and productive with the process. I also wonder, just not to interrupt, but I'm in a, again, an organization that does sort of medieval. Um, it's really like a club. It's, it's for entertainment. But we also, there are a lot of people that take it very seriously. And we actually have reenactment, reproduction fighting. And for example, my husband does this. They dress up in armor and they yeah. use rattan sticks and they and and things. And they they can they can achieve the level of knighthood. And we even have um, we even have tournaments. And for six months, you can be a king or a queen if you win a tournament along with your Rinsons. partner. And and yeah. yeah, and I've actually been a princess. When my husband has won a tourney that became a prince. And it was very interesting because. I, what I'm getting to is I've seen people, this is a game, right? But I've seen people during knighting ceremonies, and you can just feel this incredible power, and there's this archetype that goes behind it. And sometimes it really changes people. When that sword comes down, and they get down on their knee, and, and they say, you know, this is the last blow you shall ever take from anyone, and the person knighting you hits you. And it's just, you can just feel the change in the, yeah. the in the air and i've seen people's lives change not everybody's does because it, it is a game there's the same thing i've seen the same kind of power when we have a coronation of a king or a queen it's the power of the words and again some people take it very seriously for yes. six months they're very dedicated and for some people it's just you know a game but again it just seems to be some power even of it's like an, a memory it's an yeah. honor yeah it's such an honor to be married yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and it's it just is. it, you know, it really does touch the soul level. Well, if you, you, you expand that out, yeah, and, and not just the women, but the men, and the, yeah, I'm sorry, Ralph. Oh, that's all right. And if you expand that out, you know, because everything is growing in concentric circles. Every life itself is is all connected in circles. To where the world in which we live, we are living in a big game. And uh, our greatest adversaries, the, the, the Hitlers, the, the Mussolinis, the, the, the uh, Genghis Khans and everything, probably some of the greatest people we'll ever want to know. But at the end of the game, we'll go over and say, well, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here, or so forth. In other words, you played your game really well. You played your game very <laughs> well, and I played my game, and we're all, let's go for another game. I mean, it, 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 but in that, there's this power that, that you mentioned, and I feel it's the mm -hmm. same power that we feel. This, this feeling of immense divine uh, presence or intervention in what we're doing, like, oh my God, I'm not really me right now. This is amazing. This is, And that's the, well, we 
Well, and, and it's beyond words. You, yes. you really can't put words on it. But that's what we call the Christhood or the Christ consciousness. That you don't even talk about it because nobody, I mean, in your best language, you can't explain some of the, the miracles, if you will, that happen because of your knowingness of where you are and, and what you are. The difference from the duality of the belief system. In a belief system, you believe, you can also be caught to disbelieve. Religions have done this for years. I believe this until somebody says, well, mine's better. I believe that. Oh, you've got. And they keep switching back and forth. Science, uh, the medical the, med the medical profession does the same thing. Until you get reach a state of knowingness. A state of knowingness is quite simple. In the laws of nature, I simply know when I'm sleepy or I'm hungry. Or I have to use the restroom. That's a state that nobody can. They can tell me you don't have to do this, or you don't have to sleep. You don't, and that that's they're wasting their time because I know what I know, and I know me well enough to follow that feeling. Contrary to way to what the military has tried to drum out of people, that's nonsense, and you you must kill to survive, and the same thing with, with the priory there, with you know with weapons and stuff that. Um, um, is not necessary. All the music used on the show today is from MusicAlley.com, your source for free-to-air music for podcasts. The artists place their music up for free-to-air in hopes that you, the listener, will visit their site and purchase some of their outstanding musical offerings. So after the show, why not visit MusicAlley.com and explore their extensive playlist? She sings, she goes home in the evening with the dew. Do you have questions? The cards have answers. If you would like a personal reading with Melody, just go to my website, MelodyPsychicReadings.com. That's Melody with an I, PsychicReadings.com, for information. Or email me at melodyreader at gmail.com. Readings are available using Skype, phone, email, or even in person if you are lucky to live in Ireland. Why not find out what special messages the cards have just for you and book a private reading today? Do you think so? And I'm just curious. I don't know much about it. Uh, the Knights Templar, I know a little bit. But would do they possibly see themselves as guardians? And maybe that's how they feel their role is. But your role is more enlightening people. Guardians is a good word, and and I yeah I accept that as as a, as a valid thing. Although they are guardians of themselves too, because they consider themselves temples of the um, um, consciousness of the source. So they are, in order to do the best for mankind, they have to do the best for themselves as well. Ah, so this may be where it gets possibly confusing with macroeconomics and yeah. money and right. things. So in right. your opinion, I mean, I don't even know who they are. My my husband sometimes refers to them as the jackals. We've come up with that as a term, but, you know, pre probably preferable to the Illuminati because the Illuminati is something we think is, they could each really, we think that they may be part and, and connected in some way, but basically the whoever these people are or groups of people that think they run things, do you think, do you feel that the mainstream nice Templars may have gotten possibly some word crossover into this? Is this may be part of the problem? Or have they managed to maintain some sort of separation from that? Well, they have, they have, like I mentioned, they have gotten into organization on the one side, but there is an invisible force of rogue knights. Mm -hmm. And we just know each other by a glance on the street. I, you know, you don't even have to say anything. You just know mm -hmm. who, and if there's occasion occurs and you wish to it to occur, you can start a conversation, but it's not really not necessary. You communicate on an entirely different level and feel. But by rogue knights, you actually, though, in your viewpoint, would be kind of the good guys. The people who are not going along with 
what they feel is not correct, correct? Let me put it this way. Beyond good and bad, there is just is who okay. and what we are. We're, we're, we're not as any better, greater, or worse than anybody else. We just are who we are. And we believe there's differences in people, not, not, not hierarchy and lowarchy. So that what we do is, is, is generated from our motivation is love, to, mm -hmm. to love ourselves, to love, to love the animals. Look into any animal's eyes and you'll feel love. You mm -hmm. know, if, if you, if you haven't gone too far down the path of fear, uh, and anger and so forth. But, it, that's our motivation is to to love everything and share that feeling so that everybody can feel reverence towards everybody every place or everything they experience like oh my god this is and feel life just feel it in their in their in their spirit instead of saying oh yeah well, we've seen one i've seen them all you know that mm -hmm. kind of a, and and you, you <laughs> and our job has been to wake those seen one seen them all people up to say well take a closer look Tell me what you see, and then we try to get them in a, in a state where they are um, uh, not preoccupied with thinking, with the monkey brain going on and on and on. But for a moment in time and space, we we share with them something that um, they can ponder for a moment. Such in, in word sculpture, uh, the words they use. Uh, the, you, you, we show them, for instance, how do you feel now about the word depress? That's a word that we use in our, in our, our language. Depress, oh, I, I don't want to go there. I, you know, or how many somebody, they're, they're, they're depressed. What do you think about that? Well, now look, can we change the subject? I don't want to go there or whatever. They, that's mm. a feeling of, it's a little uncomfortable to think about it. Now we suggest what we call word sculpture. Take that word and slow down because you're at such a tremendous speed, you're bypassing the ingredients sometimes or the the overtones in music, for instance, that you never see unless you slow down and take time enough to see them. And that would be what? Well, that would be take the word depressed and dissect it. Now, notice your feelings now about you, how you feel about depressed. Now, take that same word and turn it into a deep rest. This person is sick and tired of the outside world. They've gone into their cave, one place or another, and said, I'll come out when I'm damn good and ready. I'm going to sit in here until I, I get it. Until I." So they're in a deep rest. So now we can say, see you, pal. When, you, when you're ready, come on out. It's a different feeling that we arrive from just splitting a word and looking at it differently. I'm smiling because I do most of my readings with a card deck called the Psy Cards, which are a Jungian deck. And they're the cave that I call, I nicknamed it the Depression card, but the card is actually the cave. And it's the symbol of a person, a, 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 a figure, human figure, like this in the cave, mm. when the cave door is in the distance, but they're turned away and they're just saying, I need some time mm. to be away now. I can show you the card when we finish the interview. I would like to see it. Yeah. yeah. But see, that's a wonderful feeling compared to a, a detrimental feeling. You know, like, oh, God, that's so great. And that's how we free ourselves in consciousness to start looking at things differently. Well, I wonder about this word. Let's take... Um, uh, um, realize. We say, well, we use that word every every day. Yeah, I realize this. I realize that. No, no, no. Slow down, and take a look at the fact that we are energy beings experiencing an illusion that we create in 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 microseconds. All of this truly doesn't exist. And you can get into quantum physics and mechanics, and and you can understand. Well, yes, that's. That's not the same cup of was a second, a second, a second ago. It's reconstructing itself in, in, in microseconds. Okay, so we, we, um, what was my point? I lost you were talking about words and really oh, looking re at words. Thank you. It, uh, and realizing. Realize. So take the word now, and, and, and I'm going to say, well, what do you think about the idea that we're energy beings? We are light bodies. We are light beings experiencing a third dimension that we create in frames of reference there's multi-dimensions 
and some are denser than others. The third dimension seems to be quite dense because it's a material form and, and so forth and so on. It's like a fan blade. The more you spin it, it slowly gets into being disappeared. It's no longer there in sight because it's going so fast. Some of the fans move that fast. But so you ask this person to take a look at what they're seeing, and they say, well, I can't see that. What are you talking about? Energy being in a physical body. And then you slow them down enough to where they begin to feel, oh, well, yeah, I, I'm i moving, my consciousness is moving this hand. If the hand's not moving itself. That's an energy. They start to get it. And then we explain, well, you're looking at it with your real eyes. Your real eyes, according to the the pineal gland in, in, the, in the center of the, the cranium and the, the Eastern uh, philosophies and, and, and religions and so forth equate this to the third eye or whatever. And when you see things in spirit or in soul or in realizing, you're seeing a completely different picture. It's, it's, you're looking at it with your real eyes. Um, for instance, this cup, I can look at it now, oh, I realize that's a cup. But if I studied it, I said, well, a composition. And this is a kind of, oh, this comes from, um, you know where that, that comes from. And, and you get down into the material and the texture, and then you get down in the molecular structure. And you can keep going and going and going, because this cup, you could spend a lifetime dissecting it, where and when and how. And, and in so doing, you expand that out because everything's connected into the cultures, into the religions, into the sciences of, of, of the world. Because, um, and there's been monks that have stayed in, in the seclusion for years, and they come out and they can surpass all the academic philosophers that ever were, or, or PhDs on all levels, from simply knowing the, the, the cause and not dealing with the effect of things. Our system deals with effects. You need a band-aid. You need a... You need a solution. You need, you know, you need to know the truth. And because the truth is so strong, if you know it, we are immortal, immaculate beings that create our own realities in microseconds. It's all real. And we expand that out. So, I don't know, do I got to carry away on a tangent here? No, I, I think it's really yeah. interesting. We, that's why I wanted to just sit here at the table, because... I wanted to, to just just talk about things. One thing I'm curious, I know I can just tell that both of your uh, worldviews want to stay very positive, but just for a second, because we know there are negative things in the world. What you brought up with about the words, something I have noticed, because I'm very much interested in current events, and I just can't stop watching, even when it looks like a train wreck. And I have noticed what seems to me more than usual, more than I used to remember seeing what seems to be a deliberate manipulation on the part of, again, the jackals or whoever, the whoever thinks they're in control, to try to change people's perceptions of what words mean or desensitize them to more than one very stark punch it mm -hmm. definition. Mm -hmm. And that almost seems to be the opposite of what you're doing, where you sit there and you think about the different aspects of the word. And I, I find that to be rather frightening. I mean, I guess it's a form of propaganda, but it's, it's, it's just something, I didn't know if you've noticed that at all. Well, or, it could be viewed that way, of course. I mean, everything can be viewed as negative well, and positive. No, I just mean it's something that's happening. If, if I don't know how much you pay attention to modern media or anything, but I've just seemed to see an uptake in that. It's all part of being programmed, and we've been programmed for eons, our parents and their parents. And we and program ourselves daily. And we accept that programming because that's what we were taught as, as we were brought into this world. It's like we've given our power to whoever, the higher level or whoever. The programming comes way back, mm -hmm. it comes from way, way back. It comes through the media, very much so. You sit and you watch a television commercial, and pretty soon you're thinking about going and buying whatever the product is. I mean, it's all, it's all programming. And it's time now that we realize, here's our word again, that we take back that power and be who we were created to be. We take back the mastership that we were created with and start now living as a, as a princess or as whatever you choose to be 
but taking that power back. Nobody needs to tell us who we are. We just need to know who we are. We say that so much that, th and this is a transition time right now. This this time right now is considered a transition time, and you'll see, and we know that, everywhere you look, everywhere you listen on the Internet, everything is, there's so many things happening right now. So it's our time, and it's time for another thing that I, I feel really good about. It's time for the balance to happen. The feminine and the masculine energy to come together in balance. So this is another very important time. And all of us need to, to think about it and know that it's it's this is who we are. Where do you think this time is moving into? Do we I know that many languages don't even have a past, present, and future. I know the Germanic has a different view. So I realize that in some ways all time is one, but working with a western audience and working with western mindset we, we do have a now but we also have a potential or potential oh, yeah. Those futures are potentials, right? yeah yeah but, but which you say that this is the time what are we transitioning into or what are the potentials that we're transitioning into i think i feel i feel the creative beings that we were created to be that the feminine energy coming together in a balanced era era doesn't mean that it's the time. I'm using the word time a lot, but it means this is the essence of our our evolution, and now it is the 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 yeah, and the, the, time. the goal in one sense, because there's many many things to the goal, is to re relieve people from servitude. Yes, okay, everybody, whether they realize it or not, are in a state of service. I can't because I got to go. I'm sorry. I got. I, I. They're under a clock. They're under time, and time really doesn't exist except when we create it from one point to the other. So the goal is to arrive at a state where you're on your own time. When you wake up, oh, what would I like to do today? Not what I have to do today. It's a different state of mind, a different perception of the day different not only a perception but it's a different way of, of doing things and so we're coming into that stage where the negative and positive the duality of the system that's been going on for hundreds of years now including the the, the, uh, the very obvious monetary system which was created by just a, a few beings that said hey we can tell them what to buy when to buy and how to buy and we'll get rich that's the Federal Reserve, how it got started. It's illegal as heck as far as moral and, and di different levels of blah, blah. But we still buy into, oh, well, you've got to have that. You've got to have this. Well, you do if you think you do. But once you reach a stage where I don't need anything but to be who I am, when and where and how I feel about myself and my environment, and if I feel good and that everything in my world is good, then to me it has to be good because I'm the creator of my perceptions. So that Hitler and the gas chambers and, and the rapes and the, and the tortures, those are examples, those are lessons that are not hitting me personally or I'd have a different state of mind. They're out there and I say, oh yeah, I've got to remember there's contrast in this thing called life on planet Earth, or third dimension. And contrast is a motivator to get people to a point of, it is what it is, and, and if I define it as, as this, so be it. We have spoken, and it's the same as saying your subconscious, when you say you can't do something, I defy anybody to try and go against their subconscious, because it'll, no matter what you try, you won't be able to do it until you change that. You change it to I can do, and your son says, very well, then do it. Because you you are, you have a genie in the bottle, and the genie in the bottle is who and what you are. I also think that and maybe this is, maybe I'm just not up to a certain level yet, but mm. as, as a, as a um, someone who's very interested in history, I would look at things like the Holocaust or Genghis Khan, Temple James period, or some of the others, as, as lessons probably both for them and for us because yes. I constantly get into people and they'll say well that's not relevant that was then and this is now and I'll say 
you know, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I, I think that there are certain patterns that human beings tend to fall into. And at one of our jobs as we progress in our lifetimes as well to learn those patterns in ourselves, recognize them in others, and then try to get work towards better patterns, I guess. So well spoken. It's exactly what I was trying to say. But you said but she it so, did it so better. easily and, and <laughs> shortly. You learn from your lessons so you don't have to keep repeating yes, And that's yes. why they happen out there. But unless they're happening to you, they're just illusions out there somewhere. Well, I mean, I don't know if there was a war or not. I don't know if there was a gas chamber or not. Not really. Not really do I know. I'm, I'm, it's hearsay. I'm assuming. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, but you Supposedly. experienced the war, so that part of it, yeah. your experience, I had you know to go that. through the war for myself. Yeah. Okay, oh, 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 this is war. Front line, my best buddy, his head was blown off right next to me, and I'm getting wounded and, and no help, and yes. And then I said, okay, this is not for me. And I pulled out of the war, and I pulled out of the military, I pulled out of regimentation, and, the you know, it's because I experienced it. And now I want to share that with others. You don't have to go to war. To experience it, you can listen to me or to people like me that yeah. have been there, and tell you it's kind of a waste of time. You could, you could just get on sitting down with a nice cup of tea and having a a, a debate with somebody instead of arming yourself. You better go my way, or I'm going to hit you, or you know, or the warring. It's not necessary. And I think that's so powerful coming from someone who's actually been a warrior on the battlefield. Much yes. that that may indeed be one of the reasons you experienced it. Because I could say that, but it, you know, the closest I've come to battle is you know discussing with my cats during the <laughs> release. They're going to get into the cat carrier to go to the vet. You know, I mean, it's just not. It's okay. It can be painful, and you may get scratch, but it's not on the same level. No. no. And no. so he knows about war, or we don't. Yeah. We didn't ex totally experience it and that's another thing that when you experience something then you know it then you can share then, then you, can you can share i've been there done that yes. and they can't deny the feeling that they feel from my story because it's a true story based in in the essence of feeling of knowing that you know i got wounded four times and why and how and what all those details if you want to know more necessary are, are available but just know that those are lessons to, to keep clear of because there are better things to do with your time than think about war. You can, you can have a nice debate. You can have a nice discourse. On, on but I feel like all of these warring kinds of things or all the experiences that we've had, the trauma and drama in our past life, brings us to this, this space right now. Brings us to who we are today. And so evidently that was the journey that I chose to, to experience this lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it's, and now it's we're all with little guys like this and, and, and extraterrestrials. Say, so we, we, we're looking at what he's describing as this wonderful <laughs> little figurine I noticed when I first walked in. The first thing I saw was a statue, I believe, of St. Francis. Who yes. if I, I, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not even a Christian, but I have to say, if I like a saint, it's St. Francis because yes. everybody knows my love of animals. And right next to it is this <laughs> wonderful little, like a ceramic of a little alien, except he's got a blue head instead of gray, which really attracted me. And he's got the little eyes, and he's wearing this wonderful little necklace. So that's what he's pointing at. Is, is yes. His name is Voltra, and he's a gift from, from a lady, a friend of ours, a sculptress, and uh, she actually has had experiences with all her life with the little aliens. So any of them that she sculptured, she is actually, they come into her, her into life. Her, her life. And so she showed pictures of them, and uh, we were, we were totally uh, just kept well, going back to him, looking at him or it or whatever. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, about two weeks ago in the mail, she sent it to us. Well, he just attracted or he, I think, I feel, I don't know that they have gender in the no, way that we do, a, but, but it, 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 it feels that the energy that he's putting out that I recognize feels more masculine. But uh, I, I just threw, you threw it to him immediately. And I think part of it was because he was blue. Yes. And it's just, it's different. You know, it's like somebody's individual interpretation rather than just, you know, looking on the cover of, I mean, it's a good book, but the cover of Whitney yes. Strieber's book has gone all over the world. And so that's what a lot of people, it's little gray men. But oh, that's interesting. So would, would this extra, would Voltron 
Vol- Vol- Voltra? Voltra. Voltra. Would Voltra be actually like an outlander, like someone who lives on another planet, or would this maybe be another dimension? Planets, <laughs> planets are another thing that, that, that has to be re-examined by the way we, we expect and, and, and examine planets. Actually, everything we see with our naked eye out there is no longer exists as it, as it was millions of years or thousands of years ago. It's all changed. But there are dimensions of things. That's, that's beyond time and space. You can, um, you can bilocate is the word they're using now. You can, you can realize that you are energy and that you're living in a sea of energy. We're all energy. We're all connected. We're like a big hologram that you no longer have to, unless you choose, get in a vehicle, plane, a car, boat, and go from A to B, only if you're having fun. That's what it was supposed to be. This should have been a giant carnival here. We should have been having a wonderful time. And the sword fights and the jousting, that should but all be great. Everything that, that feels good to you, you yeah. should be able to do. Yes. But we took it seriously <laughs> and forgot we were playing a game here. Hello. And, and so now we're at a point where we've fallen for the game. We've created... Uh, like robots or, or, or clones or stuff where they're starting to guide us and tell us what to do in our own game that we created, in a sense. And so now we get back to um, to realizing if I want to go from point A to B, I have only to set my mind to it and set an intention, not a want, not a trying, not a hope, but an intention. And if that intention is in alignment with all the natural things that are to occur in my particular destiny or whatever, then it, it has to happen, and it, and it will happen. Would this be like teleportation? Or yeah, you... it is teleportation. Uh, now, I might as well bring that up and share that with you if you like. Um, sure. For part of my experience came out of the Residence Project, which is located in, on the Big Island of Hawaii. Okay. The Residence Project is, is, a, is an organization, very quiet according to the outside science world, because they are into what's called resonance. Resonance is a state of realizing everything has vibrations on different levels. We all vibrate at different levels, different frequencies. And when you reach the resonant frequency of anything, you can change it. You can morph it. You can... You can uh, uh, do anything you want to do with it. Well, there was a person there by the name of Nissan Harriman, who's a quite famous scientist right now, that he has raised himself on a very academic level of physics, and he's a physicist and so forth. And my training has come, in fact, less than 10 miles, well, 15 miles away from here. I was raised in the middle of the woods, and all my childhood was spent learning about natural law, how nature works. So, him and I would get into discussions, and he'd say, well, you have to do this, and all the details have to fit this, and the quantum reality of 14 over 9, and, and I'd say, well, isn't it just the cause of the principle that causes the effect of that? And so we were on different different levels. So I said, well, Nissan, uh, good luck. You go your way, I'll go my way. And we created, on my side, the elders of the round table. And I was the eldest, and Elizabeth Rauscher, who was a three times Nobel uh, nominee, was one year under me. And then we had four others, and we had created this, this period of, of, of uh, alternative ideas. You don't have to put them out in patents and in building machines with nuts and bolts anymore, because when you reach a level of consciousness where you're sharing like philosophies, you are creating. You are creating these things. And they go into the collective unconscious. And when they become resonating strong enough, which uh, is in, in some uh, ways equated to... Hi, Ron. You have been listening to the first part of our interview with Ralph and Marsha Ring. 
One of the pitfalls of recording a conversation sitting around a kitchen table is sometimes, well, the guests may get an emergency phone call that they have to deal with for 15 or 20 minutes, at which point the conversation will tend to go off in a different direction. However, although I hate to leave my audience hanging in midair, that's exactly how I got left when this conversation ended at this point with the phone ringing. But it's a very good point, I think, to stop because we have about 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes more for our part two, and this makes a good length for a show. In the meantime, if you would like more information on Ralph and Marcia Ring, you can go and visit their website. That's bluestarenterprise.com, one word bluestarenterprise.com and you can find out lots of information about all their activities not just as Knights Templars but also all their work in alternative energy and many other facets. Until next time though I would like to say thank all of my audience for listening and I look forward to seeing you next time for Cat's Eye on the Future. Well here's a health to the company and one to my last. You have been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future, the show where we take a glimpse of the energies coming soon into your world and into your future. Be sure to join us again next time when we explore another chapter of Cat's Eye on the Future. Well here's a health to the company and one to my last Let's drink and be mad